This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. It's considered the largest Native American museum in the world, and it's right here in Connecticut. Coming up, we'll take you on an audio tour of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center in southeastern Connecticut. The museum is tribally owned and operated, and this year marks its 20th anniversary. Have you been to the museum? What did you learn about the Pequot people that you did not learn in school? You can join the conversation. Email where we live at WMPR.org. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. On the phone with me now is Jason Mancini, director of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. Jason, welcome to the show. Hi, Lucy. Thanks for having me on. It's quite an impressive museum. We took a tour uh, the other week, and coming up again, our listeners will hear part of that tour. Walk us through uh, when that opened. I know you've only been the director the last uh, three years, but the idea behind the museum and why they felt it was important. You know, indigenous histories in this nation are often overwritten by colonial histories and marginalized. And the tribe had some success with Foxwoods Casino at the time, and uh, what was originally conceived as a, a smaller museum quickly took on a new shape with the possibilities through revenues generated by Foxwoods. And uh, the tribe really uh, had engaged uh, early on uh, historical research and archaeological work on the reservation to tell a more thorough story, their story, uh, from their perspective, and working with university scholars, um, elders, uh, and a range of other uh, professionals to really, in a very deep and, and complex way, tell, retell the Pequot narrative. So not just the contemporary narrative, but there's 12,000 years of human occupation of this region and to really begin regrounding that narrative in an indigenous perspective. Now, Jason, uh, what about your background uh, that led you to this museum? And what did you know about the Pequot people growing up? I actually grew up in Ledgerd, Connecticut, which is where uh, the tribe's reservation is, Mashantucket. It's in the northeast corner of town. And I went to school with Pequot kids when I was a kid, uh, and at the same time, you know, learning about local history and national history and that Pequots didn't exist at the same time I was sitting next to Pequot students in the classroom. And at the same time, in the mid-1980s, my uncle had a close uh, working relationship with the tribal chairman at the time and uh, uh, began to do a very long-term archaeological project uh, on the reservation. So I became involved back then. I understand one of the projects that the museum is involved in, along with Yukon, is is understanding more about the battlefields of the Pequot War. Can you talk about that project? Yeah. The Pequot War is one of the most significant events in early American history, uh, and yet it remains very elusive uh, in the national narrative of this country. Uh, the, the conflict between the English and the Pequots it's really the center of the relationship and, and grounds Indian policy in this nation. It's often been told for 400 years through the English colonial uh, lens. And the archaeological work and the battlefield protection projects that we're working on through the National Park Service have really elucidated what this conflict was about, the impacts of it, its memory and legacy is told through various local histories and oral histories, and it's a deeply impactful conflict that uh, we're able to give new shape to through an interdisciplinary approach through our research team. And that's a big part of the mission, too. So you're not just walking through and and seeing uh, exhibits related to the history. You have researchers coming to your facility to do uh, that work as well. Can you talk a little bit about that, Jason? Absolutely. Um, So the archaeological work is one component, and we've worked collaboratively with a range of archaeologists from around the region who've come here, studied sites at Mashantucket. We've identified over three, around 300 sites that span 12,000 years here. But more than that, we've uh, done tremendous uh, historical research that focus on the tribe and the tribes of this region. Uh, And because of that marginalized history, we've been able to really root through a range of resources from historical societies, personal archives, national archives, uh, going as far away as uh, Europe. We found archives on Pequot people and and Native people from southern New England and Hawaii and in Alaska and New Zealand. The folks here uh, were not these sort of marginalized backwoods 
folks. Uh, they were remarkably cosmopolitan, global citizens very early on after the, the colonization of this region. We have a couple minutes left, Jason. And uh, again, when the museum was first created, uh, there wasn't a lot of com- a competition in the casino world. And a lot of uh, the, the funds that the, the Pequots, uh, were, Mashantucket Pequots were able to earn during that time helped uh, build such an expansive museum. What are the challenges uh, moving forward um, in terms of getting uh, other people interested in supporting this museum? The world of museums is always challenged by financial considerations, and you know we're working through some of that and building partnerships with colleges and universities, uh, especially right now UConn and, and Conn College have been great partners where we're working collaboratively on some new initiatives uh, around human rights education, social justice initiatives, programs around diversity and inclusion, and really kind of taking this story of indigenous people from this region and not thinking about it just as as something of the past. But, you know, we really consider here indigenous futures uh, and engaging contemporary issues in Indian country is something that's really been overlooked in this nation for for far too long. Uh, You know, last year's Standing Rock really brought some of this conversation to a head. Uh, We participated in that. And for, for most of the Indian communities in this nation, every one of them has some type of standing rock, and we want to bring attention to that for the American public and and raise the level of awareness and engagement around these issues. So through those kinds of initiatives, we're looking to build funding sources and uh, opportunities to grow our mission and vision for the future of the museum. I've been speaking with Jason Mancini. He's director of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. Coming up, we're going to hear an audio tour of the museum from, again, from the natural history of the region to the distinct culture of the Pequot people. Jason, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks, Lucy. Coming up, we're going to hear that audio tour, and we hope you stay with us. This is where we live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. You just heard from Jason Mancini. He's director of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. Where We Live got a tour of the more than 300,000 square foot facility in the southeast corner of our state. Yeah, so this is our typical group entrance here. Chris Newell leads us through the expansive museum where he's head of the education department. He tells us a little about his background. He married a member of the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation, but he grew up in Maine as a member of the Passamaquoddy tribe. Where we are standing currently is we are in uh, one of the main entry places, which is called the gathering space here. So you'll walk in and you're going to see three large dugout canoes. Two of them are replicas with life cast figures in there. All of our figures are life cast from real people, so they're very, very lifelike. And then, of course, the third machine that you see there, that is an authentic dugout canoe that we made here at the museum, a 36-footer named Nukamis, who is uh, actually the longest dugout canoe produced in this area in the last couple of hundred years. Years, uh, made from tulip poplar. So that begins your visiting experience right there. Even as we're just gathering together, we're bringing our school groups into this area, we're coordinating who's going where, who's starting what tour. You know, this begins uh, their experience here. And uh, the architecture of the building also adds to that. So the word Pequot translates to the people of the shallow water. And so the uh, floor here, this large blue floor with this speckling with quahog shells spread all around them, uh, represents a large estuary estuary, which is where the Pequots would live as they seasonally migrated throughout the season. In the summer and uh, late fall, they would be on the ocean shore camping around estuaries. And so this room represents a large estuary. Uh, In the top of the room in the glass ceiling, there is uh, an architectural structure that looks like an overturned machine or an overturned dugout canoe. And then when you guys enter and exit the building, the facade of the building looks like a giant wampum belt. And a wampum being a big part of the tribal history here, uh, those being shell beads made from specific shells we find around Long Island Sound here, the Quahog and the Channeled Welk found in this, this area, used uh, you know, amongst the tribes for gifts of significance, but when the Dutch arrive here, they become part of the trading network as well. And that's where we kind of get the idea of you know, wampum as Indian money, uh, but that was never the case amongst the way the tribes use it amongst themselves. And uh, it's just the Dutch would use it uh, as an exchange rate because they wanted beaver fur. And so uh, we cover a lot of that in the history 
as we go downstairs. Uh, once again, when we go down, it's a very immersive experience while you're here. And so you're literally walking into spaces that are full recreations of the time and place, um, you know, of uh, the exhibit itself. From the gathering space, Chris leads us into an entrance exhibit where the walls are covered in bark and rocks. These rocks were excavated during construction of the museum back in the late 1990s. Chris says they recycled them for use in both the interior and exterior walls of the museum because they view rocks as the first gifts from the land and the water. Now, one of the things that we do at this museum that's uh, not common amongst museums is there is a mixture of natural science and ethnohistory here. So the beginning of the tour actually starts with a whole lot of natural science. We will see large animals that existed here 10,000 years ago, what we call megafauna, uh, mastodons, dire wolves, giant beavers, caribou. Uh, and then we start to transition forward. And as we do that, we see the change in climate here and people adapting to those changes. And then we see the namesake of the Pequots taking shape as they start fishing and advance advancements in technology that happen all the way through, usually through trade, uh, and a lot of tribes in this region here traded from all over. In fact, uh, Passamaquoddy people were located in eastern Maine. The word Connecticut in my language translates to something long and straight. Um, that was our place name for the Connecticut River, which if you looked on a map is a pretty straight north-south flow. It's an accurate description of that river. To the tribes in this region, that word Connecticut translates to the long tidal wetland. And so this is the land where the Connecticut empties out. And so we knew this place as Connecticut as well. Even all the way up, eight hour drive by car, you can imagine by canoe how long that trip would be. But we did come down here to trade for the wampum that was created by the tribes here, as well as some other things that they had. And we traded our technologies back and forth and we learned from each other. And that's one of the things I always try to get across on my tours is that native peoples are not static. We are not stuck in one mode of time. We have always adapted to new technologies as they became available. And so when the Europeans arrive, the Dutch especially, they bring their uh, iron kettles and brass kettles and other metal goods, just natural that the native people would, uh, in this region would take advantage of those new technologies. And we'll be seeing that as we go through the exhibits. So here we are in our entrance exhibit. We have a welcome from uh, Terry Bell, who was actually the uh, first director of the museum when the museum first opened back in 1998. And then, you know, we see some of our major sponsors. That picture of rhododendrons, we kind of p walked past it, but there's a little bit of uh, a reason why we put that there. Um, the, the rhododendrons that grow in the Great Cedar Swamp, which is located directly behind the museum, which has the 12,000-year-old paleo remains in there, that area was known, that swamp was known uh, traditionally to the people as a place of refuge. They would go into that swamp to leave behind their enemies. Very thick undergrowth in there, very hard for people to follow them uh, when they would go in there. And so uh, they would use that space during the time of the Pequot War. And the English, uh, you know, a, a sachem, a Pequot leader, would take his people into the swamp trying to escape English soldiers as they were following them. They end up being caught and massacred in the swamp. And ever since then, it's said that the color of the rhododendrons now uh, grows pink because of the blood that was spilled there. So it's a little bit of the tribal lore we have going on there. Um, they're white in that picture, which is how they grow just about everywhere else. But in the Great Cedar Swamp, we do see pink rhododendrons grow there. So one of the few places you'll actually see that. So this is what, uh, when you enter the exhibits, you begin with this picture of the Mashantucket Pequot community. Uh, this was taken in 1998, but still representative of the community of today. And what uh, the lesson I try to get across to folks here is, uh, you know, this idea of what does an Indian look like? You know, some people have a, a preconceived notion of what, how Native people look, um, but, you know, it's, it's more about more than looks. And so if you look at this picture, we see a lot of various ethnicity mixed in with the tribe of today. Um, that's a part that's part of their story why this would happen but these folks right here through their history would steadfastly hold on to their land base here at Mashantucket and uh, this reservation being the oldest continuously occupied reservation in the country um, you know set aside for them in the year 1666 um, so the reservation system actually starts here in Connecticut these folks would through some very harsh and unjust times like the Pequot War and like uh, the census data the state was doing to try to eliminate their identity as Pequots, uh, they would steadfastly hold on to their land base here, their identity.
identity as Pequots and their self-governance of this land here uh, through some very, very unjust times. And uh, so their story is one of survivance uh, and making it through those very, very difficult times. Uh, so these folks right here are the ancestors and some of them themselves that suffered through the time of not being recognized, living under the, the, the thumb of the state as wards of the state under first the Parks and Wildlife Department and then the Welfare Department later. Uh, and the state had complete control of them. They achieved their federal recognition and they now are striving towards self-sufficiency. And this is actually one of the most self-sufficient tribes in the nation now. They can make a living wage off of their own economy here with the casino. And so the end of the story, when we get to the end of the exhibits, actually ends on a high note. You know, even though we see the massacre and other things that happen throughout their history, we actually see in the modern day times in 2017, a thriving community here with uh, the ability to use uh, monies for mon education and housing. Um, and um, they are all once again back, uh, you know, allowed back on their ancestral land here, which was, you know, the uh, difficult thing for them to remain to, uh, to do. The oppression of the state reducing this reservation from 2,500 acres originally down uh, by the 1960s to only 200 acres. Uh, now it's back to about 1,100 acres, but that 200 acre plot was the worst part to live on. Uh, many of them had to make the difficult choice to leave the reservation, many of them ending up in the coastal towns due to the whaling, due to the whaling industry, and that's where we saw intermarriage happen for about 100 years. That's why we see the various ethnicity mixed in here. But once again, even though they lived off reservation, they considered themselves as Pequots first. Uh, and that's very important because that when they would come back and reassume their land ba uh, base here, um, having that identity and being able to prove it was a big part of them achieving federal recognition. This is where we live. Today we're taking you on a tour of the largest Native American history museum in the U.S. It's right here in Connecticut. The Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center is in the southeast part of our state. Our guide is Chris Newell. He leads the museum's education department. One of the most striking features of this museum are the life-size dioramas. But before a visitor reaches those exhibits, the museum focuses on the natural history of the region. Visitors are led back to the Ice Age via escalator down into a turquoise room designed to mimic glacial melt and where water cascades down the walls. So the walls are, uh, you know, replicas. They look like a large glacial wall. Uh, and they're really well done. You know, the, the dirt that would be in the ice and everything else that's located in there. We see some of the rocks frozen in the ice. And then we hear water rushing. So as the glacier is melting, uh, of course, it's going to cause water to rush down and drip off of the ice cave. And we have certain sections where you see water dripping down. So it's really an immersive experience for kids especially, but for all people. I mean, everybody kind of gets a thrill out of this uh, uh, riding this escalator, you know. So it's kind of one of the highlights of the, of the journey as you go through here. So we get here, uh, and this is where this globe right here shows uh, the movement of ice over time. Uh, there are three different colored dots that you see represented on there. The white dots representing ice as the glacier grows. The green dots, what that is, is as the glacier grew, um, the sea level dropped. And so that would become dried land on the continental shelf as the sea level would drop below that. Uh, so that's where we see the green dots showing up. And then the blue dots we just saw as the glacier is retreating, it's leaving behind some glacial formations like uh, famous ones like the Great Lakes and Hudson's Bay. Uh, and so that's what we see going on here. So this is a good way to, uh, you know, visually represent for, especially those that haven't had this natural science before, how the ice would have moved, how much it covered, at what time period. Uh, and, you know, really gives them a good idea, you know, but we're at this point, we're only talking natural history here. We're going to transition in a little bit. Uh, but we also have, include a set of pictures here on the wall. These are all on the reservation here. These are just more evidence of the glacial uh, rock formations that were left behind. Uh, council rocks there, a uh, big flat rock that uh, makes a, a natural meeting space in the woods that's located here. Balancing rock on the bottom, that big boulder there dropped in that precarious position. It's actually hanging over the edge of a precipice. You can't tell by the picture, but um, the story with that is if that rock were to ever fall, it's a sign of bad luck for the community. So it shows that they give spiritual significance even to the stones. Um, and then, of course, uh, the first picture there, that's, uh, you know, the rocks that we see all through the soil here. That's 
how colonists would find this land, uh, which would drive them a bit nuts, you know, because they wanted to convert it all to farmland. So they had to remove those rocks. And so what did they do with them? They created all of the rock wall boundary walls that we see all throughout Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, that's what they were doing is literally move, had to do something with the rocks to create farmland. And so they created boundary walls with them. So if you're wondering, anybody wonders why we have those all through the woods in Connecticut, they seem to go nowhere. At one time, Connecticut, for the most part, was pretty much all clear cut and turned into farmland by colonists. Uh, and we only have new growth forest here. And so uh, they would do a lot of change to the land. And one of the things they left behind was those boundary rock walls that we have all over our woods. So we transition now to another gallery. At this point, we're talking about ice, you know, so we can't live on top of the ice. So this is where we talk about the arrival of people. And what we've done, this is a native museum here. We've actually stepped away from science in this gallery. And what we do is we use art to represent creation stories. Um, and so we have nine different creation stories represented here from tribes all across the U.S., Canada, uh, different regions. And so what you do, uh, these uh, art pieces commissioned to help tell the story. Uh, so these were commissioned specifically for uh, the stories that they're telling here. And, uh, you know, I always tell people, take the time, read the placards. What you find is some there are some commonalities going on here every story is very different but some of the things that are common are the idea that the land is uh, not an object that you can possess but it's something that sustains you uh, so that's a concept that's very different from uh, European colonist ideas of land usage where they do own land um, and uh, native cultures here in this region um, they did not own land they owned possessions they did have that concept but the land itself was considered like a living being and so you could not own it it sustains you instead so that's what we see going on here is creation stories we use creation stories because it doesn't matter where in the world you come from your culture has a story of creation this is where we live i'm lucy nalpathanchel today we're learning about the history of the mashantucket pequot tribal nation through their museum in the southeast part of connecticut chris newell is our guide he's head of the museum's education department after the break, we'll continue our tour where we take you to one of the museum's most impressive exhibits, a half-acre replica of a Pequot village in the 16th century. And later, we'll learn what happens to the Pequots with the arrival of the Europeans and how the Pequot War dramatically shaped the tribe's future. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening to Where We Live's podcast on Connecticut Public Radio. And while I've got you, here's our promise. Great conversations and analysis are just part of what we do. WNPR covers the news that matters most with voices you can trust. But we need your support. Make your contribution at wmpr.org slash donate or 1-800-584-2788. Thank you. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up tomorrow, we'll sit down with Regina Mason. She's a relative of a runaway slave who went on to live in New Haven. Mason's journey to learn more about him inspired an award-winning documentary. Now, Gina's journey, The Search for William Grimes, will be screened at the New Haven Museum this evening. More information on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Today we're on a tour of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center in Southeast Connecticut. Chris Newell is our tour guide. He's head of education at the museum. Our next stop is one of the most memorable exhibits here. It's a replica of a Pequot village. So you walk into this village, and uh, for little kids, it's often a wow moment as they walk in here because it's, it, you don't see exhibits this large and this detailed in many places. And so the, for a lot of kids, this is the first time they see something this big and this detailed. And what you're seeing here is essentially a summer village day. So uh, we have a garden. The advancement of horticulture doesn't arrive here until about a thousand years ago. So that's something we haven't seen that shows up here in the village exhibit. And what they're growing are corn, beans, and squash, known uh, culturally as the Three Sisters, growing in a style of farming called complementary farming, where they're planted in bunches together, and uh, they affect each other and help each other to grow when you plant them in that way. And this is a style of farming practiced by tribes all the way out as far as Arizona. So this is something that would um, make its way and migrate itself up here to the northeast from the southwest. And this is where actually a piece of their mythology, uh, their history uh, from the spiritual sense matches up with the science because the story of how they got 
the corn, beans, and squash were that they were given by their southwest deity named Katantuit to the crow, and the crow brought them here to the people in the northeast. And the advent of corn in this region actually does come from the southwest, and so it does actually match up with uh, their traditional stories here. So we walk through the village and once again you see the various numbers throughout the floor here. We have various scenes going on here. This is the preparation of a meal, new technology showing up. And because of the advancement of horticulture, a lot of their food preparation is not the preparation or drying of meats at this point. It is vegetable processing here, corn, beans, and squash, and mostly corn. Corn is a Native American crop, by the way. It doesn't just come in yellow. I always try to get that across to the young ones. It comes in all colors, you know. And uh, the stuff we call Indian corn, really all corn is Indian corn. That's uh, my little uh, message for the young ones. It was a crop invented by Native peoples all the way in the south. Southwest, it eventually migrates up here to the northeast. And uh, corn, beans, and squash, by the way, if you eat those three vegetables, they will sustain you. It meets all your nutritional needs. And so it was a very smart thing for Native people to grow corn, beans, and squash because even without fish, without meat, or anything else, they could sustain themselves off of the vegetables alone uh, if necessary. But this area of southeast New England has fishing, it has good hunting, it has a little bit of everything, and so they actually had a ton of good nutrition here, and the village people look very tall. That's on purpose once again. We know that Pequots were written in history for their size and stature, and really that's due to the tremendous nutrition and natural resources available to them in this region of Connecticut. So we see an estuary right here. So this is a live example of an estuary rather than the symbolic one we saw in the gathering space. So we see fresh water coming from the waterfall flowing down the brook. The young men here, they are fishing for the tatog, the blackfish, harpooning them, tossing them up on shore to that young lady who's cleaning and gutting them with a stone knife at this point. That's going to change pretty soon when the Dutch arrive and smoking the fish on that platform. We see a large number of bark-covered weed twos. Those are actually the winter covering. So even though we tell people it is a hot summer day, the bark covering is actually the winter covering. But we do see in the backside here of the village a cattail reed-covered weed two, which would be the summer covering. And the reason for using reeds, tribes all up and down the coast do this. Uh, it's a lot cooler during the summer months. The air can pass through gently. And on a rainy day, all of those reeds absorb water. They swell up and uh, they become waterproof on a rainy day. So reed technology during the summer months was used by coastal tribes all the way up and down the Atlantic coast and even on the west coast uh, in this region typically using cattails. Uh, and uh, cattails are even uh, uh, before you make them into uh, the mats, if you cut them fresh, they are edible. Uh, so that becomes a food source as well. The leadership of the village we talked to here, we just walked past the Sachem's Wee Too, and that's one of the Wee Too's that we open up to the public. They can walk inside there and see uh, what an inside of a Wee Too would look like. There are also three side galleries we're not spending much time in as well. Uh, side galleries built onto the side of this one large room here, talking about Pequot Village daily life, uh, a little bit on the language and some of the spirituality. And then we see the last side gallery being the arrival of Europeans because we're about to walk under this large log, this broken tree, and this represents a break in time. So now we uh, change the time from 1550s to the 1600s, and we're talking about the arrival of the Dutch here. And we see uh, a big change to the village, the uh, uh, advent of the palisade wall being built for protection or fortification. Um, largely, this doesn't happen until Europeans arrive. A uh, couple of reasons. Number one, the Dutch were new, so they were a little scared of each other. Dutch settlements also had high walls, but the Dutch brought with them trade goods, iron kettles, brass kettles, steel tools, trade cloth, beads. These were very valuable to the Pequots, uh, and they set up a good trading network with the Dutch. And uh, what happens is other tribes become jealous of the relationship with the Dutch, and they become contentious and hostile during this time where they were previously pretty good friends. Uh, so the protection is not just from the arriving Dutch, but also contentious and hostile tribes who are all competing with each other for the ability to uh, trade with the different European groups are arriving here because it's not just the Dutch that arrive here a little later we're gonna have the English arrive here and when that happens we now have all the ingredients that create the soup we call the Pequot War. 
This Is Where We Live on a tour of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. Our tour guide, Chris Newell, leads us from the lifelike Pequot village into a hallway where a group of school children excitedly play a Native American game of ring and pin. We stop outside one of the museum's theaters where a movie plays detailing the Pequot War. All right, so this red hallway is red for a reason. This is where we get into talking about the Pequot War. Now, the Pequot War occurred from 1636 to 1638 between the Pequots and the English settlers. So what happened, essentially, is the Dutch were here for 30 years. They did make good friends with the Pequots. They were making good money uh, with the wampum beaver fur trade. And what happens is the Mayflower then arrives in Plymouth in 1620, right? Gloucester gets established by the English in 1626. And then by the 1630s, they're in Rhode Island and now in southeast Connecticut. And what happens is uh, the Pequots, being the largest political and military force, allow the English to set up a couple settlements on the Connecticut River uh, at their permission. They start to trade with both the Dutch and the English. But unfortunately for the Dutch, this means they are now splitting the profits between them and the English. This actually angers the Dutch in their relationship, and it sours. And there is some small skirmishing fighting that's going on because the Pequots Pequots are, uh, in the Dutch point of view, not living up to their trade agreement and only exclusively trading with the Dutch. And so since they're losing money, they're upset. But the war was between the Pequots and the English. But really, the, the beginning of the war starts with uh, uh, an action of a Dutchman. A Dutch tradesman captures a Pequot sachem, ransoms him for 50,000 wampum beads uh, d- during the souring of the relationship that was happening. And the tribe pays the ransom, but they were betrayed when they, uh, they were returned a dead body. Uh, Uh, which angers the Pequots against the Dutch, but really against Europeans in general. However, trade still so valuable that they're trying to keep it going. And so later on, the son of that uh, sachem that was killed is making another trade deal with an Englishman, a man named John Stone. John Stone did not have the best reputation. He was trying to cheat the Pequots, and he gets figured out, and they fight in the cabin, and in the process, John Stone gets killed. Now an Englishman has died in Pequot territory, and the English decide they're going to enforce their own law in Pequot territory. And remember, at this point, they're existing here at the permission of the Pequots. So their attempt to do this was really an act of aggression. And uh, they would demand the heads. They would come with several ships at the village where uh, John Stone was killed, demanding the heads of those killed, uh, uh, those involved with the killing of their countrymen. And uh, the Pequots basically tell them, "You wait here." We'll, come, we'll go talk about it and we'll come back with our decision. But the English don't trust that they're going to come back with the decision they want. And so they attack the village. And uh, uh, several villagers get killed, several women get captured. And now uh, the relationship between the Pequots and English uh, really starts to become hostile. So fast that eventually the, Pe- uh, the English leadership in Hartford would declare offensive war on the Pequots. Now why? There's a couple of reasons. The Dutch, once again, were here for money. Okay. So they weren't here to live permanently. The English, very, very different story, all right? The Mayflower, those folks were coming to live here permanently. So they wanted to make their settlements prosperous. And so one of the ways to do that was to take over the beaver for wampum trade, who the Pequots were basically in control of and the English were contentious and hostile with. So if you eliminate the land of Pequots, you can now work with other wampum-producing tribes who are friendly to you, like Narragansetts, who they did make a good friendship with. So they do declare war on the Pequots in 1636 with the aim of eliminating the land of Pequots. This was an attempt at a genocide. This is the first time a European power takes on a native power here in the Americas. And uh, the first year of the war, actually the English don't win a battle. They're technologically superior, but tactically very much inferior. They're used to open field battle tactics uh, where, you know, that occur in Europe, where native people don't fight that way here. And tactically they were doing things like drawing soldiers out of forts into traps in the woods where they were uh, popping down out of the trees, jumping up out of the leaves, and they're getting the soldiers that way, which the English felt was kind of unfair. But that's the way Native people fought here, so they would have to adjust. So the turning point of the war happens right about the midpoint in May of 1637. The English would ally themselves with Narragansetts, Mohegans, and some other tribes in the region here against the Pequots. And uh, in the early morning hours of May, uh, late May uh, 1637, they would sneak attack a fort in Mystic, Connecticut. 
and light it on fire and in the process kill 600 men, women and children known as the Pequot Massacre in history. This was the first win for the English in the war. This was the turning point of the war. With their allies they would continue to win through the next year and then eventually subjugate the Pequots as slaves. So at the end of the war um, the Pequots lose their territory to the English by conquest which is about 250 square miles and the English draw up a document. Uh, the document was called the Treaty of Hartford. Now this is an English uh, document, okay, it's written in the English language, so it has the values of England in it, which includes the values of land ownership. A lot of the provisions were basically about what they're going to do with the land that they had just conquered from the Pequots, and they even exclude their allies, Narragansetts and Mohegans, from coming onto the land. They're not allowed to do so. And they also make, uh, they create the relation, a new relationship. They basically say that if Mohegans and Narragansetts, if you guys start to fight with each other, we the English are going to come in and settle the fight for for you at threat of war. And so this is the dynamic that now gets set up. The English existing previously at, by permission now are taking over the power in this region here from even their allies. And the surviving Pequots um, are subjugated as slaves. And so that's why we have two Pequot nations of today. Those subjugated as slaves under the Mohegans would eventually become the Mashantucket Pequots. Those subjugated under Miantonomi and the Narragansett would become the Eastern or Pawcatuck Pequots. So the war causes the split. But really, both Pequot tribes are just Pequot. Uh, and that's their original standing here. And, um, you know, in, in modern day America here, we have one of them federally recognized and one only state recognized. It is not fair that that situation occurs. They are both uh, descend from the exact same stock of people. Both tribes should be federally recognized. The Bureau of Indian Affairs back in 2002 granted the Eastern Pequots federal recognition, but they lost the status three years later after the state of Connecticut and three towns appealed the Bureau's decision. Now, the Eastern Pequots to this day are still trying to regain that recognition. Pequots were still Pequots. It didn't matter if they lived here or not. So many of them moved off reservation to find jobs and work. And because of the whaling industry, a lot of them ended up in coastal towns in this region here. So this is a map of Westerly and Pawcatuck, which is just down the road from here. These red dots represent native owned or native rented homes. And if you look, they're all consolidated together into native neighborhoods. In fact, this area was called the Westerly Indian Neighborhood. And it just so happens that this Westerly Indian Neighborhood coincides with the black and Italian neighborhood that surrounds it. So um, naturally, a hundred years of them living this way, they did intermarry. And so if we think back Back to that first picture, the various ethnicities mixed in with the tribe of today. This part of their history is where that would, ha that would occur. But these folks, even though they're living off reservation, even though they're intermarrying, never gave up their identity as Pequots. It's just to the state. The state said, you don't live on the reservation, you don't count. So what happens is, by, uh, it gets so dire here, by 1900 there's only 11 families left, by the 1960s it's only two women left on the reservation. And they were told by the state, if you die or leave this land, we're going to take your last 200 acres and turn it into a state park. They would have lost their nationhood altogether had that happened. So those two women saw the writing on the wall. What they started to do was hand out governmental responsibilities to their relatives who self-identify as Pequots in these off-reservation areas to draw them back to the land here and start counting higher numbers back here in the reservation. That mantle was taken up by one of their grandsons. Elizabeth George's grandson is named Skip Hayward. He's elected chief in the 70s. He would start economic opportunity here on the reservation. Very small scale at first and they didn't all, they weren't all successful. Uh, so maple syrup business, a hydroponic lettuce facility, a, gar a vegetable garden, a, you know, a small restaurant called Mr. Pizza and um, uh, they also raised hogs. Uh, so this didn't allow for people to make a huge amount of money if they're going to come back here and really 70s housing is pretty evident that uh, trailer that we see over there at the end of the exhibits here that's what 70s housing looked like on the reservation no shower in there you had to use the hose in the back um, so if you're going to come back here you coming back to live under those conditions and under the th you're going to be under the thumb of the state so skip uh, at the time saw the value in getting the tribe federally recognized now that means you have to prove to the federal government you have existed with a government a land base 
all the way from the time the United States government began in the 1700s all the way up to the present continuously without a break. That's a difficult thing to prove. Some trials have been trying for 20 years to go through the process to get approved. However, the census data that was taken against and used against the Pequot tribe all those years actually became valuable evidence in proving their existence here over time continually. And uh, eventually they would call somebody on a census uh, Pequot or Indian. And so they did have official records that show people on the reservation self-governing this place. And they win federal recognition not through the BIA process but through a federal law called the Connecticut Indian Land Claim Settlement Act in 1983. Now, the land claim had to do with that sale of land in 1855, which was illegal. And the uh, first uh, Congress created a law called the Federal Trade and Intercourse Act, uh, which said that Indian land could not be sold without the approval of the federal government. That was done by the state alone in 1855, so it was illegal. Skip sues the landowners, uh, the, uh, the disputed land, not with the idea of forcing them off the land, but with the idea of righting the historic wrong. So part of the settlement included a payment of $900,000 for the loss of land, which they were then able to use to rebuy land. And so the end of the story actually ends on a high note here. Uh, the reservation was increased from 200 acres up to about 1,100 acres uh, from willing landowners. They never forced anybody to sell. They gained federal recognition. They have money for housing and education. And laws that have to do with federally recognized tribes like the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act apply here on the reservation. And so the Pequots in 1992 open up Foxwoods Casino. At the time, no competition for it. Grows to become the world's largest resort casino uh, for a while. And now it's the largest in the Western Hemisphere, I believe, but still, you know, one of the top leaders in the industry. And so now the tribe can come back and live on their land and make a living wage off their own economy. Uh, they are the most, uh, one of the most self-sufficient tribes in this nation right now because they are not so dependent on federal money for survival as they are dependent upon their own economy that they created themselves here. So the end of the story does end on a high note. The land is now repopulated populated by Pequots. Um, we have, uh, you know, close to a thousand of them uh, living on or near the reservation. And it gives us also this great big giant museum to work in here, which is, you know, the place I love to be because I love this work. I love teaching Native history. And I get to use this awesome facility here. And so the casino is also part of the creation of this place as well, which is really a treasure for the state of Connecticut and really for this country because of the history that's told here and how well we were able to tell it. That's Chris Newell, head of education at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center in southeastern Connecticut. For photos of our visit, check out WMPR.org slash where we live. Today's show produced by senior producer Lydia Brown. Thanks to the staff of the Mashantucket Pequot Museum for our extensive tour. Also, thanks to producer Carmen Baskoff. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.